Welcome to episode 25 of Awesome Astronomy for July 2014. And after recording on location at the Herschel Museum, and then while meteor hunting under dark skies in Wiltshire, we're back in the studio here at Cydonia Base, Damien and John are back in their cages, and normal order is finally resumed. My name's Ralph, your host for this month's show, and joining me as always to put the awesome into awesome astronomy and boldly go where no one has gone before is my colleague Paul. Uh, all that time away, my chair's lost its groove. <laughs> Right, I need a moment. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a packed and varied show for you as we embark on our third year of awesome astronomy. We've got news from Venus and Pluto, a five-minute concept to delve into the world of comets, the first in a new series of interviews about some of the most spectacular scopes ever built, a competition so that you can win the new film that's just come out, Gagarin, First in Space, and we round that off, as always, with your astronomy questions. But before that, and in a world where we have SpaceX now planning to land people on our home world Mars within 12 years, what have you been up to this month, Paul? Well, it's been a busy few weeks. Um, I've been solar observing with schools and demonstrating planetary science at some science fairs. Um, Special mention to Lionel Primary in Brentford, who were the most delightful group of five-year-olds. I spent the day imaging the sun with them. Um, They all took some fantastic images. Um, Let's see, gave a couple of talks. One to the fantastic Wickham Astronomical Society. Hello Mm -hmm. to them. And the other at a National Trust property called um, Great Chowfield, uh, which entailed talking about the sun in an amazing medieval hall surrounded by tapestries. Oh, wow. Yeah. But one thing I've not done much of is astronomy. Uh, <laughs> I mean, the evening weather's been pretty miserable for the last month, hasn't it? Um, and, well, yeah, after a day's in the sun doing doing solar imaging and things, it's, I've, I've been a bit frazzled, a bit lacking energy <laughs> by the time it's getting dark after 11 o'clock at the moment. So what have you been up to? Well, I wish I could say exciting stuff like you, but I can't. I've not even been doing much observing either. But one of the things that I've been grappling with this month is the amount of stories we read in from respectable academic sources that seem to be making bold claims on just hints of evidence. And I'm not sure this is how it's always been done. Am I looking at this through road tinted spectacles and thinking scientists reported solid results rather than tenuous hints in the past? Oh, go on. Give me an example. An example. Okay, well, um, the one that jumps out is the CERN announcement this month that the bee quarks aren't decaying as you'd expect, which was described as being like mixing up a chocolate cake recipe, throwing it in the oven and coming out as a vanilla cake. And the long and short of it is that they say this points to something weird going on and hinting at being on the verge of discovering new physics. But we also reported on the uh, BICEP2 results a few months ago, claiming gravitational waves from the Big Bang had been Mm -hmm. detected, which is still in the balance. You'll remember the Faster Than Light Neutrino oh, yeah. press release before that. And <laughs> Who can forget that? One? <laughs> exactly. And I, I don't know. Am I just getting grumpy? Or is the need for press attention more important than a fully tested and validated result before publishing these days? Well, I mean, you know that, that that's been getting my goat of, of mm. late. Um, yeah, I mean, it's partly poor media reporting, I think. I mean, many media outlets have a pretty shaky grasp on the scientific method. And that's even without pointing to the likes of Daily Express whose grasp on reality, let alone science, seems to be one dead princess away from the nut house. Um, <laughs> but I, I do feel that a certain amount of sensationalism has crept in on the other side of the wire too. Um, there seems to be a readiness to announce and grab the headlines. Now, there have been claims this allows us to see scientific method in action, and um, well, I suppose that's a point, um, except it's a rubbish point, because nowhere in the scientific method does it say, announce immediately any exciting-looking finding to the public media reported mm, as a yeah. discovery. So Science for My Money is a process that you know, seeks to bring knowledge closer to truth and this scattergun effect of firing off half-baked discoveries in the hope of getting a name on any future prize list is doing nothing but damage to the overall public view of science. Yeah, we used to joke about NASA doing science by press conference every time we got notified about a groundbreaking NASA mm. announcement. And, and when the news isn't that newsworthy, it just diminishes the esteem that you hold the scientists and the institution. And you remember uh, NASA's big Titan press release a few years ago and Felicia wolf Simon's arsenic-based life form oh. research. <laughs> you know, they might have even been the same story. There were such damp squibs. I forget now. (laughs) But that train of thought got me onto thinking that with huge collaborations and institutions working together and theorists proposing ideas before they can be tested, who deserves the Nobel Prizes? You mean the theorists or the experimentalist debate? Yeah, but it's even thornier now, I think. If we take gravitational waves as an example, Einstein, who proposed gravitational waves, and Lemaitre, who suggested the universe started in a very small state, are dead, so they can't get the prize, mm. you can't get it posthumously. Does Alan Guth get it for suggesting our modern understanding of inflation? 
Does the Bicep 2 team get it for possibly observing the beam mode polarization? Will the Plank team get it if they confirm the Bicep 2 results, which is by no means certain? Who does get it? Because this is going to be just as muddy from now on because individuals rarely make discoveries anymore. Yeah, I, when I hear the prize giving, I actually, I, I've never been sure what the Nobel Prize is awarded for sometimes. I mean, it, it, it's for, is it for making a breakthrough or discovery so astounding as to change the course of human understanding? Mm. Or is it just for really good science? So, you know, sort of grown up science fair project mm. prize. I know the sorts of big discoveries aren't made every year, but it does have the air of a sort of meaningless knighthood sometimes. Mm. You know, it, it, certainly no more than three people, and the lack of posthumous award means that there are some very strange awards. I mean, such as, I mean, the lack of award for Rosalind Franklin or Jocelyn Bell Burnell. Yeah. Um, the fact that someone like Lamartre can't be given the honour even posthumously um, seems ridiculous to my mind. Yeah. So when we talk about a certain team we get the prize, it will, of course, be living members only. Um, so nobody die in those teams. <laughs> yeah. um, and no more than three of them. Um, and in this era of science we live in, um, that, that seems very draconian. I mean, teams like Bicep are massive. Um, yeah. It would be surely difficult to pluck the three worthies from amongst them all. Yeah, and if you're one of those people on the Bicep team that doesn't get <laughs> involved in that, then you're going to feel pretty peeved, Yeah, aren't you? exactly. I mean, it, it doesn't seem fair, does it? And in some respects, there is a mismatch, I think, between the, the sort of long-term narrative of science and the short-term success and glory that things like the Nobel Prize seem to demand. Mm. Um so, I suppose, where do you end? I mean, in many respects, I suppose modern science is built on the foundation of Galileo and Newton, to name two. Um, perhaps it's a bit ridiculous to award them posthumous prize. <laughs> um, but, you know, that's my in- inconclusive tuppence worth. I'll be quiet now. <laughs> <laughs> but it does show what a thorny issue that it really yeah. is. And it's that, well, that's ignoring the politics oh, of it as well. Yeah. On, on a trivial note, Einstein getting his Nobel Prize for the photoelectric effect rather than relativity is a bit like Martin Scorsese getting his Oscar for The Departed in <laughs> Apology for Overlooking Goodfellas. And, yeah, and that, bit... that was awful. <laughs> it was Look, an awful film. film. Was great. An awful decision. <laughs> no, I think The Departed was an awful oh, film yeah, as Departed, well. Terrible. Certainly by comparison to Goodfellas. Goodfellas is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, that's a bit flippant. The photoelectric mm. effect did lead to quantum theory, but gender politics in particular has been uh, having its head raised in numerous shameful incidents, as you, as you mentioned yeah, earlier. Yeah. So my thinking is that we need to play them at their own game. So to, to hedge our bets, we need to get some wacky ideas down on paper in case experimental cosmologists actually find evidence for them. At least we can get our names in the Wikipedia entry, even if we don't get the Nobel Prize. Oh, I, I like that idea. I'm scratching my head over this one because it's difficult to just make something up that could be true that hasn't already been thought up. I mean, a sixth state of matter could well be discovered, but has it been theorised already? I don't know. If not, I'm going to say that it is there and I want it called the Cydonia Flux. Right, okay, well... I'm going to say that as the universe is often quoted as being the size of a grapefruit in those early Mm -hmm. fractions of a second, I'm going to say that it actually was a grapefruit in that earliest time, and I predict that a NASA team will announce this to great fanfare next year, probably after a small leak and a drip feed of false anticipation on Twitter. Um, It'll be refuted by a team at CERN, who announced that it was actually a large naval orange (laughs) that travelled faster than light, and thus we will witness the scientific method in action. Black will become white, the Daily Mail will ponder the ramifications of all this on house prices and immigration. I like that. You have made one schoolboy error, though. You've made a testable prediction with the time frame. Think like the astrologers and psychics. Keep it vague so you can claim you got it right, whatever the outcome. And let's go with a nice vague one. Since we find that every time we delve a bit deeper, there's more and more at the atomic and then subatomic level, I'm going to say that electrons and quarks aren't fundamental particles, and no matter how far you go, there's always more and more apparently fundamental particles forever. You never get to the bottom, and there's no actual fundamental particle. (laughs) So uh, it's just like a a Mandelbrot set forever and ever. Yeah, and when it's discovered, even if it's after I'm dead and I can't get the Nobel Prize, I'd like it to be called the Wilkins Continuum. (laughs) Nice. Wilkins all the way down. Oh, thank you, Bertrand Russell. (laughs) Okay, well, let's turn to things that have at least a semblance of certainty about them, and for that exact reason, we'll not cover the B-Quark decay findings at CERN, but we do have a few interesting news items this month to tell you about. First up in the news this month, some nice work being done to model the Pluto system ahead of the arrival of the New Horizons spacecraft next summer. That's going to be the first spacecraft to get a close look at Pluto and its moons. But it's not Pluto itself that we're concerned with here, because Elisa Roden, who's a postdoctoral programme fellow at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Centre, has been modelling various possible scenarios for what Pluto's largest moon, Charon, 
might have been like in the past if cracks and fissures show up in New Horizons images. So we're now familiar with hearing about cracks in the thick ice around Saturn's moon Enceladus and Jupiter's moon Europa and the deep oceans and lakes that they give us glimpses into from the water that sprays up through these cracks. But while we're not expecting to be lucky enough to see water geysers on Charon next year, we should see if there are any telltale fissures. That's fissures, F-I-S-S-U-R-E-S, not <laughs> F-I-S-H-E-S, which that would be cool, wouldn't it? Can you imagine <laughs> sending a spacecraft out to look at one of the most remote and barren worlds in the solar system and then finding that it's teeming with fish? So <laughs> if New Horizons does spot any cracks on Charon next year, that'll suggest tidal pulling between Pluto and its moons when their orbits were expected to have been less circular in the past. Tidal forces of this kind are caused by an object tugging on a smaller body that has an elliptical orbit around it, causing its surface to flex and deform enough to generate heat. That's a bit like when you repeatedly bend a credit card to rip it up before throwing it away, the point where you bend it one way and then the other starts to warm up. And it's the friction caused by tidal pulling that allows Jupiter's icy moons Europa, Ganymede and Callisto to generate enough internal heat for oceans to persist underneath their ice layers. So because we're unlikely to send any landers or drilling probes to the Pluto system in the foreseeable future, this might be the only way to get at the past habitability of this remote dwarf planetary system. But, of course, we're not suggesting Pluto's moons have or ever had had life, are we? I mean, No, no, you're right. That would be too much to infer. But as we see with other moons in the solar system that are well beyond the temperate zone, we may well get clues into where the conditions suitable for life could exist way beyond our current thinking. Yeah, and Elisa is a good choice of scientists to be conducting these models. She's written lots of papers um, published over the past decade or so on Jupiter's moon Europa, um, its cracked ice and subsurface ocean. Yeah, so for this kind of research, you want someone who's something of an expert on tidal conditions on icy moons. Yeah, so to be clear, these models won't suggest a scenario um, in which life could still exist on Charon now. No, there are different scenarios that account for different thicknesses of the ice on Charon, uh, different structures to the moon's interior and different orbital evolutions but on that point about its orbit however Charon's orbit did evolve it has a circular orbit now and that means that there won't be any tidal forces warming its interior and if New Horizons does show us some surface cracks a liquid subsurface ocean that may once have existed should have solidified long ago to leave this giant icy snowball of a moon yeah but what I like about this is that, one, Elisa Roden's thinking about scenarios and running models for multiple scenarios nice and early uh, in readiness for next year's flyby. And two, this could be useful for exomoon research before we've even detected any moons outside our solar system, especially in showing us that planets in habitable zones aren't necessarily a prerequisite for life to exist as more moons join the ranks of Europa, Enceladus and Titan as possible platforms for life to begin on. So we'll wait and see what type of cracks, if any, New Horizons spots next year. And before we move on, just how exciting is New Horizons? Oh, that's going to be a fantastic <laughs> probe. It? First pictures of Pluto, just months away now. Anyway, while we're lurking around the solar system, you've got some cool news from the European Space Agency's Venus Express Orbiter. Yes, skimming the atmosphere oh, of Venus. Oh, oh, yeah. So the Venus Express Orbiter has been studying Earth's twin since 2006, looking specifically at Venus's atmosphere, climate, magnetic field and surface features. Yeah, and although it's still working fine, it is running out mm. of fuel and its mission comes to an end on New Year's Eve this year. So the mission team at the European Space Agency are going to try something dangerous to eke a bit more science out of it now that they've got nothing to lose. Aerobraking. Exactly. And just the name aerobraking is cool. Mm. But yeah, this technique of using the atmosphere to slow a spacecraft down has already been used on Mars by the Mars Odyssey and the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter spacecraft and around Venus by the Magellan spacecraft in 1993. But for Magellan, it was to adjust the spacecraft's orbit. In the case of Venus Express, they're deliberately dipping into the upper atmosphere. Yeah, and remember, this bird has no wings. Absolutely. It's not made for flying through air, only space where there is no air. So it's now dipping down into Venus's atmosphere and measuring the effects of drag as it slams into those air molecules that it's not designed to encounter. If they get it wrong, it'll deorbit and burn up, but that's not going to happen. ESA mission controllers are doing a controlled incremental excursion into the rarefied air of Venus, dropping from what they call the lowest routine altitude of 190 kilometres to the special low altitude of 130 kilometres. 
Yeah, and that's already begun, hasn't it? Yeah, it started on the 3rd of June and it'll run until the 11th of July. And actually, they're noticing less drag so far than they were anticipating and all the instruments are working fine rather than overheating or suffering from the onslaught of bothersome air molecules. So by the middle of this month, we hope to have learned more about the upper atmosphere's effects on spacecraft and other potential uses for aerobraking to allow spacecraft to safely sample atmospheres, to advance flight control techniques and test out the possibility of future low altitude orbital planetary missions. Yeah, so not a literal blaze of glory for the Venus Express, but it's certainly not going out with a whimper. Yeah, and it's always good to see spacecraft being put to other uses before they conk out. Mm, Absolutely. And you're not straying far from home at all this month. Everything's all solar system based as you finish off the nice asteroid story. Yeah, this is a nice piece of work from astronomers at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena and the Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico. So here's a picture of the asteroid pool. It was imaged using signals fired from the 70-metre Goldstone radio antenna in California, Mm -hmm. bouncing those signals off asteroid 2014 HQ124, and then received by the 305-metre Arecibo dish. And if you've seen the James Bond film Goldeneye, Arecibo is the dish that Pierce Brosnan and Sean Bean fight to the death on near the end of the movie. But in a nice irony, this asteroid's about as big as the Arecibo dish. It's actually just a bit longer than the height of the Eiffel Tower. And this imaging took place when it was zipping by Earth at 12 kilometres a second and was three and a half times the Earth-Moon distance. And you can see the images are really quite impressive. Mm. The, The thing about radar is that the radio waves are large, so the picture resolution isn't usually very good at all. But by combining radio dishes like this, well, you can see here that it's so good that you'd almost think it was taken from a spacecraft on a flyby. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, you can see a certain amount of surface detail, essentially. Mm. I mean, for something that is only sort of 300 metres across. And at um, such a distance as yeah, well. Yeah, exactly. Um, looks like a dinosaur head. If you ask me, <laughs> it's like a T Rex skull yeah. with a big nostril. Um, it kind of does, doesn't it? Yeah, um, but I mean, it's a fantastic image. I mean, a really, really great piece of science there. Yeah, well, this technique actually gives us a resolution showing features just four meters wide. And that, as I said earlier, this is not bad for taking it uh, at a distance of three times the distance between the Earth and the Moon. Hmm. They they took twenty one images over four and a half hours, and they show us that it's actually two asteroids that aren't stuck together, but they're gravitationally bound and moving in space together in tandem in what's called binary contact. And that's why it has that peanut shape or the dinosaur shape that you were talking about. And actually one in six nearby asteroids have that peanut shape, uh, this this binary contact formation. But from the radar data, we can also tell that it has a rotation period similar to the Earth. We can refine its orbit to 288 days. It's sized to 1,210 feet in diameter and we can reveal all those nice details. And this is only possible because of a recent upgrade uh, in the equipment at Arecibo. So as they play around with it more and more, it's it's going to be Mm. nice to see what other uses they put it to. Yeah, absolutely. So, staying in our own solar system, in a year when Comet Eisen failed to live up to the hype, but when Pan-STARRS is visible in binoculars in the Northern Hemisphere and Comet Jax in the Southern Hemisphere, this month's five-minute concept has Paul telling us all we need to know about these icy wanderers. They could be responsible for so much we see about us, including our very existence. They have provided the water of our oceans, the molecules that started life, and at times have shaped the path of evolutionary survival. Then there's the meteor showers. Yet for centuries, these hairy stars were seen as portents of doom and disaster. King Harold of Wessex's downfall was apparently foreseen in the heavens, shown by a comet on the Bay of Tapestry. While hairy stars have been blamed for plague and disaster throughout mankind's violent past, not just a warning from whatever god you worshipped, but directly responsible as the noxious vapours that issued forth from their tails fell to earth, the original alien invasion. Comets are odd beasts. They give the impression of great speed with their vast tail, but appear to move through the skies with deliberate slowness. They can be tiny, barely perceptible objects seen only through a good telescope, or vast great comets that fill the sky with a stunning streak of white visible to all month after month. What are they, and where did they come from, is a problem that has taxed humanity for centuries, and even today they hold us entranced and secure a large amount of research time and funding. As a young boy, I was allowed to wait up late to witness the culmination of Europe's first deep space mission, Giotto, 
which was the first spacecraft to have a close encounter with a comet. In this case, Halley. While this year we wait with enormous expectation as Europe's latest and most ambitious deep space mission, Rosetta, approaches Cheryomov Gerasomenko and attempts to place the lander Philae on the comet's surface. Millions spent chasing hairy stars across the sky. Our knowledge of comets has expanded dramatically since the 1980s and the missions to Halley. We've had more close-ups from other probes and Earth-based observations have improved dramatically. So what do we know so far? Well, first the basics. Comets are not particularly big, Halley being currently 15 kilometres long and most are under 60. The body is referred to as a nucleus and around it, as it approaches the sun, forms the coma essentially a tenuous atmosphere from the outgassing caused by the heating and bombardment of light. This coma is then blown on the solar wind and forms the tail, or I should say two tails. One made of dust tends to follow the line of the comet's orbit, while the second, the ion tail, made of the volatile gases, points directly away from the sun. This, of course, means the ion tail can be leading the comet if the body is moving away from the sun. American astronomer Fred Whipple was the first to suggest that comets were essentially dirty snowballs, made predominantly of water, carbon dioxide, ammonia and dust, and the observations since 1986 have borne this out. We know the nucleus is very dark, very dusty and very dry. In fact, comets are some of the darkest objects in the solar system. Giotto found that Halley was reflecting just 4% of the sun's light, while in 2001 the Deep Space One probe found that Comet Borelli had a surface temperature of 25 to 71 degrees Celsius, and a dusty surface devoid of water, suggesting that the volatiles we see in the tail are all under the surface. Certainly, observations including Giotto suggest that the coma forms from jets of gas that appear at fissures in the surface, and this was further confirmed by the deep impact probe that hit Comet Temple 1 and revealed the water below the surface. And then there's the organics. In dust samples we have found methanol, hydrogen cyanide and various hydrocarbons, as well as the amino acid glycine. And recent work on meteorites suggests that adenine and guanine, both components of your DNA, may have cometary origin, brought to Earth in early impacts that may also have brought some of the world's water, and in the impacts themselves may have helped form amino acids in a process known as shock synthesis. Rather than bringers of doom, comets may well have been the harbingers of life itself. The origin of comets, both physically and temporally, is still a matter of great debate. There are several categories of comet, with the main Earth-observed comets falling into two broad categories of short and long period. Short period are those with orbits of 200 years or less. Halley, for instance, has an orbital period of 75 years and reaches out just beyond the orbit of Neptune. Right now, it's just beyond the orbit of Neptune, over 5 billion kilometres away, in the constellation of Hydra, if you're wondering. And that is pretty much where we think it started out, as a body in the Kuiper belt, just beyond Neptune. Long period comets are those that have orbits longer than 200 years. And by longer, some comets don't mess around with a few measly hundred years. Comet West, before it broke up passing the Sun in 1975, had a calculated orbital period of 250,000 years. Where these comets come from, it's a bit of a circular argument, in that they are predicted to come from the unobserved Oort cloud, and one of the major pieces of evidence for this is the existence of long-period comets. That's not to damn the theory, but it does highlight our lack of definitive evidence in this area. But further back in time, where did they all originate from? In a deeper sense, beyond orbital mechanics and chemistry, what are comets? Well, one clue lies in the dust sampled by a probe called Stardust. This probe found crystalline dust that could only have formed at temperatures above 1000 degrees Celsius the sorts of temperatures found in the inner protoplanetary disk in the early days of solar system formation. Comets, it would seem, are the leftover bits, the scraps from the birth of the Sun and planets. But then so are asteroids. It may not surprise you to hear that some objects within the main belt of asteroids appear to occasionally outgas and form a coma. Well, for the interview this month, we're going to kickstart a series of interviews about the revolutionary telescopes that the European Southern Observatory build and maintain for professional astronomers to explore the skies with, building up our astronomy knowledge and making almost daily discoveries. 
Dr Joe Liska returns to tell us this month about the European Southern Observatory's venerable 3.6 metre telescope in Chile. Hi Joe, welcome back to Awesome Astronomy. Hi Ralph, it's good to be here again. Well, this is the first in a series of discussions where we're going to talk about each of the European Southern Observatory's installations. And we're going to start with one of the oldest of the still operating scopes run by ESO, the 3.6 metre telescope. So can you start by telling us where and when the 3.6 metre scope was built? Yes, so the 3.6 meter was in fact uh, the main reason why the European Southern Observatory was brought into existence in the first place. So when uh, in the mid-1950s, a bunch of European astronomers got together and uh, decided it was time for Europe to have a uh, a large telescope of uh, in about three meter class, um, you know, following on what the Americans had done at, uh, at the Lick Observatory and uh, Mount mm-hmm. Wilson and other observatories. And then the Americans kind of discovered, in a way, uh, Chile and the, uh, the Atacama Desert. And then pretty quickly, um, the Europeans then decided, abandoned the idea of, of building ESO or the ESO's observatory in South Africa and switched to Chile. And then, uh, so eventually after some site testing over there, they essentially uh, then um, settled on a mountain that today we call uh, La Silla. And uh, the observatory is at about a height of about 2,400 uh, meters. And so that's then where the uh, the 3.6 meter was being built. So originally the 3.6 meter was actually going to be a three meter telescope, uh, but then it was increased to uh, about 3.5, 3.6 meters. Uh, and the, the, there's, a, there's, there's a funny story around why this was actually enlarged. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm not actually sure this is entirely true, but anyway, I'll, I'll tell the story <laughs> anyway. Uh, so apparently, the uh, three-meter telescope at the Lick Observatory it had, had a, a so-called prime focus cage. So it was a, a little room in the prime focus of the telescope where the observer would actually sit in and, and exchange photographic plates and so on. Uh, and apparently on the Lick three-meter telescope, this prime focus cage was very was quite small and particularly it was small for quote unquote a bulky observer uh-huh. <laughs> and so but <laughs> but increasing the size of the cage would you know obviously would shadow the main mirror of the telescope too much so they decided well if we're going to have a bigger cage we need a bigger telescope uh-huh. So, so not a seems, smaller person, a bigger telescope. That's right, not a smaller person, <laughs> but a bigger telescope instead. So it kind of seems that the fact that this telescope turned out to be a 3.6 meter telescope was owed to the fact that one of the main observers at the Lick Observatory at the time was uh, not only an outstanding scientist, but also seemed to be of larger than usual uh, body size. <laughs> Uh, the telescope was uh, began its construction in the mid 60s really was when the first designs were done uh, in Germany but then it kind of uh, stalled it was just too much from they weren't big enough to handle the task so then in in 1969 i think it was it was decided or early 1970 it was decided to bring the project in house and and to, mm-hmm. to create a, a telescope division for the purpose of uh, to, uh, of actually handling the, pro- the, the construction of the telescope uh, in-house. And that telescope division was then established in 1970 on the premises of CERN in, in, uh, in Switzerland, yeah. so near Geneva. And there was already strong links or ties between ESO and CERN. And so the, uh, it was decided to try and capitalize on the technical experience and the technical expertise that was already present at CERN uh, to help us out with uh, with the 3.6 meter project and eventually the telescope had its first light in, in November of 1976. And it's probably best well known at the moment for the HARP spectrograph that's sitting on the telescope uh, but before its current use with that HARP spectrograph it hosted quite a range of different but quite similar instruments. Can you take us through those? That's right. It really took off, uh, or the, the science on the 3.6 meter really took off with CASPEC, uh, uh, which was a, um, a spectrograph uh, installed, I think it was in 1982, uh, on, uh, on the 3.6 meter. And uh, so that was a high resolution uh, spectrograph, uh, which was as an appropriate instrument for 
you know, one of the largest telescopes of the time because, mm. you know, you have a lot of photons that you can collect. And so you can um, uh, split up those photons in by wavelength and you can do it at relatively high resolution. Yeah. And so that, that spectrograph then was uh, was put to very good use in the, in the 80s and produced a number of results. It was there when, in 1987, when the supernova uh, 1987A went off, Caspec was used to to look at that. So yeah, so that was Caspec. Uh, then there was an instrument called EFOSC, uh, which was a very a multi-mode instrument which could do a number of different things. That you could do imaging with it, you could do uh, low-resolution spectroscopy with it, you could do multi-object spectroscopy with it, it could do uh, coronography. Uh, so all of those uh, things. So and EFOSC, a whole range of applications. A whole that could range. Be of, I think there were eight different modes to EFOSC, wow. and also. At the 3.6 meter featured one of the first, uh, if not even the first, uh, adaptive optics system. Uh, of course, called, yes. Called Adonis. Uh, so that was one of the first times this was uh, adaptive optics was demonstrated uh, in anger, if you will, on a you know in a in a on a real telescope on sky rather than than in a lab. And presumably that acted as a very good test case to give you more confidence that the bigger scopes that you were going to be working on at the European Southern Observatory would actually work. That's right. Yeah, that's right. But so since 2008, the only instrument that has been operating on uh, on the 3.6 meter is the HARPS instrument. Uh, so again, this is a spectrograph, a high resolution uh, shell spectrograph. This is more or less dedicated, although it's not the only thing it's used for, but it's more or less dedicated to discovering and investigating extrasolar planets. Yeah, And that has really done tremendous things for, for the science. Uh, it's just difficult to overstate the role yeah. that HARPS played in this field. And we're going to come on to that in a moment, but I think uh, the 3.6 meter telescope is also a, a good living example of how an old telescope that, that's old by today's standards can be kept young and relevant by renovating its mirrors and domes too. Absolutely. Um, uh, there were a number of refurbishments that were done uh, on the 3.6 meter. The secondary mirror was uh, replaced at some point in the 2000s. And uh, yeah, and just keeping it alive, keeping uh, changing the control system uh, and so on. But also the instrumentation just plays a, an important role. You know, mm. finding the right instrumentation for such an instrument, for such a telescope, for such a facility is, is really important. Sometimes called niche so, or finding the right niche but that comes across as a or has a has a negative uh, connotation because it's not really a niche you know what the, the, i mean exoplanet science uh, what the 3.6 meter, 3. meter is doing is very much at the forefront is very much mainstream and mm -hmm. very much at the forefront of what astronomy is about uh, today so it's it's far from being niche science but it found the right niche in parameter space to investigate uh, uh, exoplanets in this case and um, and to to uh, take science a big step forward and so that was uh, really a, a great example of putting an older facility to excellent use. Well you, you mentioned already about the HOPS instrument that's now on the 3.6 meter telescope and I think it's fair to say that HOPS is undoubtedly best known for the exoplanet discoveries that it's continuing to make. Do you want to tell us how it works and uh, why it's been so successful? Yes, so um, what HARPS essentially does, or what HARPS was designed to do, is to be really good at measuring radial velocities of stars. So what does that mean? So um, if a star moves, if it moves along the line of sight between us and the star, then this movement uh, can be seen in the spectrum of the star due to the Doppler effect. Mm -hmm. uh, so if it, you know, if uh, if a source, uh, so if the star is moving uh, with respect to us, then it's uh, absorption lines in the spectrum of the star will be shifted compared to the lab laboratory wavelengths of those lines and that shift is just simply due to the to the Doppler effect and from that shift you can measure the velocity of the star and so what you do with HARPS is you go off and, and measure the velocity of a star but not just once but you do it over and over again over very long time periods mm -hmm. over years and so what you then uh, see if that planet if that star has a planet in orbit around it what happens is that the star actually wobbles due to the gravity uh, due, due to the gravitational pull of the planet, the star actually wobbles around uh, the joint center of mass of the star and the planet. And it's the, not just a star that's tugging on the planet. The planet's also tugging in a smaller way on the uh, on the star itself. That's exactly right. So usually when you, when you uh, picture a star and planet system, you usually picture the star to be stationary and for the planet just to orbiting around the yeah. star. That's not actually quite accurate. The, the, the proper picture is really to picture both of them 
orbiting around the center of mass. Mm -hmm. Now, the center of mass, of course, is because the star is so much uh, more massive than anything else uh, in, that, uh, in that system or more massive than the, than the planet. The center of mass of the system is, in fact, very close to the center of the star. It can be inside the star. But nevertheless, nevertheless the star is being pulled along by the gravitational pull of the, um, of the planet, and so it does wobble about. And it's the... Uh, the line of sight component of that wobble that you can then see in the spectra. So if you take uh, uh, many spectra over, over periods of years, uh, then what you see is that over time, the, uh, the star actually performs this very regular movement along the line of sight. Mm -hmm. And from that movement, you can deduce a, uh, a limit on the mass of the planet. And you can deduce also the, uh, the period at which the, the planet orbits, and from the period you can get uh, the distance between the planet and the uh, and the star. You know, just that's just Kepler, Kepler's law. Yeah. Um, so, so just from these, you know, conceptually pretty straightforward uh, observations, you can you can already uh, you can discover a planet. You can see yes, there is a planet here. You can get an idea of its mass, and you can get an idea of its orbit. So that's already uh, pretty good. And do you want to give us a run through of some of the exoplanet discoveries that Harps has made? Oh, there are so many. Yeah. Uh, so there were so many firsts uh, that, that Harps made. Uh, so one example is in 2010, it discovered uh, one of the richest uh, uh, exoplanet uh, systems that had been discovered until that date uh, around the star HD 10180. I think it was uh, five planets it discovered, and there were hints for two uh, additional planets. So, um, you know, multiple planet systems had been seen before, but this one was beginning to approach what we see in the solar system. Mm -hmm. uh, then it had, uh, at the time, it discovered one of the uh, lightest exoplanets uh, that had ever been uh, found. It was Gliese 581c. I'm really impressed that you're remembering the numbers. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping I'm not getting this wrong. <laughs> I was just hesitating there. I'm hoping I'm getting this right. So that was, I think it was about two Earth masses, uh, so that was one of the, the, the closest ones. And there were just uh, you know, a huge uh, range of, uh, of discoveries and a huge number of publications that have come out of Harps. It's been very a very productive instrument, uh, one of the most productive uh, instruments of, uh, in all of ESO's history. Am I right in thinking that the nearest one was also discovered by Harps as well in the um, Alpha Centauri system? That's right. Uh, so uh, the Alpha Centauri system is a triplet star system. Uh, it's a triple star, although the, the uh, Alpha Centauri C, the third star, is quite a long ways off, uh, away from A and B. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is, the, uh, so A and B are the, the closest stars to us. Uh, they're only about 4.2 light years away from us. And Alpha Centauri B uh, did show a, uh, the sign of a planet, However, that discovery has been disputed. Uh, so some American colleagues didn't see quite the same uh, signal. Uh, the uh, discoverers of this from the Geneva group, uh, they maintain that this is uh, correct. The problem is right now uh, we won't be able to collect much more data because Alpha Centauri B is now too close on its orbit around uh. Alpha Centauri A. Uh, it's become, it's, you know, they're now too close on the sky. So do we have to so wait a couple of thousand years before we can test it? No, again? it's not that bad. It's not a couple of thousand <laughs> years. This is just a few years. But we have, oh, that's we have to wait for a few years until, we, uh, until this one is... Uh, will be uh, will be put to rest. But um, so at the moment uh, there is an indication that there's a planet there, but it's being disputed. So we will have to wait and see how this one turns out. Uh, and I'm curious to know, Joe, how much longer do you think the venerable 3.6 meter telescope will continue to be operational, and, and what do you think its legacy is going to be? As to the uh, uh, how long. Uh, the 3.6 meter will still be operational. The short answer is I don't know. Uh, so that's uh, just in general tied to the question of whether ESO will continue to operate mm -hmm. the La Silla Observatory. But no plans uh, to suspend operations there? It, it is intermittently being discussed um, uh, whether to close it or not. Uh, but it, you know, closing the observatory is not as easy as it might sound. It's not uh, Closing an observatory is not just a matter of uh, locking up uh, you know, switching off the lights, uh, locking the doors, and, and leaving. Uh, you have to put the, oh, the observatory uh, essentially um, into 
back into the state in which it was before we started everything. So you actually have to take everything down there. So there's significant. So closing down an observatory is actually connected with the. Um, there's, there's a significant amount of cost involved there. And presumably more expensive than leaving it open. <laughs> That's. Exactly the point. That's where I was heading with this. Yes. Uh, so the annual operation cost is, is actually not that high. It's not a big <laughs> burden on the ESO budget, and um, so it, at the moment it is in fact cheaper to keep it running than to close it down. And you know, in particular, while it's producing great science, um, you know, why not? You know, um, uh, at La Silla, ESO, uh, the 3.6 meters is not the only operating uh, telescope. We're still operating. Uh, another one, the new technology telescope, which I'm sure we'll be talking about later. Mm -hmm. um, so there are no uh, indications that we're going to close uh, La Silla anytime soon. We, uh, this will keep operating. Now, regarding the, the legacy of the 3.6 meter, ESO's very existence is the legacy of the 3.6 meter. Without the 3.6 meter and without the wish of European astronomers to build such an instrument, ESO may have never come into existence. Um, uh, but in terms of science, I'm pretty sure that the legacy will be, uh, is it will be in the area of exoplanets. That's what it will be best remembered for, I'm, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure it will as well. Um, but it's a, it's a nice poignant place to end that the uh, 3.6 meter telescope is so pivotal to ESO's existence as well and uh, thanks very much for speaking with us again Joe we all appreciate the work that's being done by the European Southern Observatory to help us get new insights into the universe and uh, we'll speak to you again in a few months to talk about the next scope in ESO's arsenal okay I'll talk to you later then Dr Joe Liska thank you very much bye bye So on to probably our favourite part of the show, where we get to play around with the questions that you throw at us. If you want to ask us an astronomy question, and we especially like the ones that let us get all opinionated, then just tweet <laughs> them to at awesomeastropod, email them to the show at awesomeastronomy.com, or post them up on the Awesome Astronomy Facebook group. And our first question comes from Lee Garner from Norwich in the UK, who's also at Cosmic Beach on Twitter. And Lee says, hey you mad Martians, I have a question for the podcast. When we look at other galaxies, we can clearly see the glowing bulge at their centres. Why is it when we look up at the Milky Way, we don't see one? Thanks for all your efforts. So, good question, Lee. Paul, surely being so close to our galactic bulge, it should be apparent to us at night. So why isn't it? Mad Martians. Is he trying to be funny? Mad? He doesn't know the half of it. <laughs> right, well, Lee, it is a good question, and as ever, there's no single answer. We can see the centre of the galaxy, and if it's dark, you can nip outside and look for the constellation Sagittarius, which, from northern latitudes uh, at the moment, um, is on the southern horizon. And if you have a dark sky, you locate the Milky Way to the right-hand side of the constellation, and there you're looking at the centre of the galaxy. Um, and you're right, unless you have some decent photography kit, it may not be apparent that this bit of the Milky Way is any denser or brighter than any other part. Um, first thing to say is the effect of dust. The galaxy is full of the stuff. Um, between us and the centre of the galaxy is an awful lot of dust. It's the stuff that new stars are formed of. It blocks light, obscures our long-range view, and helps hide the galactic centre. It actually obscures our view of things beyond the galaxy as well. Um, it may seem pretty clear up there, but the view we have is one from inside an extensive dust cloud. In radio and infrared astronomy, an awareness of this dust and the techniques to subtract its effects are, are really essential. Um, then there's also the effect I like to describe with the analogy of a city. Um, if you stand back from a city, preferably on an aircraft, to get some decent distance involved, you'll notice that the city looks like a bright blob, a continuous sea of light, and that the concentration of light is intense in the centre and fades out towards the suburbs. If you're not sure what I mean, go and Google a satellite image of London or New York, for instance, at night. Now, you get the impression that to be inside that city, it would be like standing in a sea of light, and that the centre would perhaps be overwhelmingly bright. But of course, when you stand in the city, that's not the impression you get. You see the individual street lights, you see the sky above you still, you see the distant aircraft flying over. Of course, the view is obscured and light pollution is a whole different topic, but nonetheless, you can be in a dark street in a brightly lit city. So when we see other galaxies, the sheer distance blends the light of stars and gives us the impression of a bright centre. Yet being inside our own galaxy, we're aware of the great distance between stars, and while we see a more concentrated strip of light across the sky, we don't perceive a greater intensity of light that being outside suggests there should be, um, if that makes sense. That said, if we were suddenly to be able to stand in a space outside the galaxy, like standing in a field with your scope in the countryside outside the city, you would suddenly discover a greater depth of darkness than you would find inside the Milky Way. 
So it's all a matter of perspective and dust and distance. So I hope that answers your question, Lee. So for the second question this month, we're returning to the topic we discussed in the introduction to the show, because Mark Cullen, who's Mock Wepper on Twitter, asks, should the Bicep 2 team have made their announcement pre-peer review? And I'm torn on this one, but if you're listening and you don't know what peer review is, it's the standard way that science has been reported since it was introduced by the journal Nature in 1967. So not actually as traditional as many think, and it works like this. So after a result or a discovery, a researcher or research team writes up a research paper to explain their findings. This gets submitted to a research journal like Nature or Science to be read by two or three experts in the same field of research to determine if it has enough quality to be published in that journal. If accepted by the editor, that journal publishes the paper making it available to all the world's academics to read and to try and pick apart. So should the BICEP2 team have submitted their research papers for peer review or published them themselves? And the simple answer is, you have to go down the peer review route if you want to show tip-top credibility. But I'm still a bit uncomfortable with how the peer review process prevents the wider public from seeing those papers because of expensive firewalls. It just seems a bit anachronistic in this internet age that journals are only available to academics or paying customers at anything up to $50 for each research paper. So if researchers with known integrity back up their press release by self-publishing two quality papers with all of their data, as the BICEP2 team did with this gravitational waves announcement, then I'm quite comfortable with that. But known integrity is still the issue here, because I do get where they're coming from, and you can't blame them for holding press conferences if they think they've got big news. All science teams are gasping for research grants. A rising government science funding may well be a vote winner for you and us, but for most people, health, education and defence will be far more important and may make increased government science spending something to vote against. So while scientists get their research funded, they naturally feel an understandable obligation to inform the taxpayer of the successes that came from their investment. They have pressures to help them improve the standing of their university or research institution. You know, lots of external and internal pressures and politics come into play. And then, of course, you don't want to get pipped to the post by uh, another research team if you've spent months or even years researching something. So, I think my overall feeling is that unless you're from an organisation that has the internal research review and integrity of, say, NASA or CERN, to be taken seriously, you do really have to have the peer review process in place because if you take that tier of quality reviewing out, there's a risk of sloppy science creeping in. And if you're going to release your news and research papers without peer review, you've got to be comfortable knowing that not only are other academics going to try and prove you're wrong by replicating your results, which is how it should work, but your credibility is going to take a serious dent and you run the risk of looking foolish if you've messed up. Not that I'm suggesting the BICEP2 team have. So really, I'm quite comfortable with the way the BICEP2 team announced their news. But I think that's probably only because they're a quality research team. If they were an unknown entity from an unheard of university, I'd definitely want that peer review in place before the press conference came along. Did, did you just contradict what we said earlier when we had our big rant? Possibly. Well, that's just about all for this month's show. Don't forget that we have video versions of the Sky Guide on our YouTube channel, which you can find by typing Awesome Astronomy into the YouTube search bar. We have a vibrant Facebook group that you can find in the same way over on Facebook. And if you like the show but haven't left a review on iTunes yet, please do, as it does help push us up the listings and bring astronomy to more people. And it's not just Apple users that can download us. If you use Android devices, you can download a free podcast player such as Podcast Addict or Podcast Republic straight to your device from Google Play and use that to search for us. And if you use a Windows phone, you can do exactly the same from the Windows Store using any of the free apps such as Podcasts or the Podcast Source. And this month we have a competition in collaboration with our friends over at Fetch Publicity. We have two copies of the new movie Gagarin First in Space. Yeah, this is a new film that was released on the 23rd of June. It's about Yuri Gagarin, um, who on April the 12th, 1961, became the first man in space. Now, this film is, well, it looks amazing 
frankly. Yeah, from- to me, it had a kind of the right stuff or Apollo 13 feel about it. But one, the thing that really struck me was the cinematography. Yeah. It was an absolutely beautifully rendered film. Really, really beautifully shot. And I, I think any space nut out there is going to really enjoy this. A couple of interesting facts about it. It's to coincide with his 80th birthday. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, the film is exactly the same length as his first orbit. 108 minutes. And if you want to win a copy of this, we have two copies to give away. Just head over to www.awesomeastronomy.com slash Gagarin and enter your details in there. There's no quiz or anything like that. And two people will be winning a um, a copy of this film. And we'll be running this competition from the first of the month when this podcast is released all the way up to the 14th of July. And if you don't feel lucky or you want to go out and get the film anyway, go to Amazon and look for Gagarin First in Space. And good luck. And before we wrap up this episode, we now have the lineup sorted for September's Astro Camp. Which isn't far away now. We'll have a talk from Cardiff University's Jenny Millard on galaxies and dark matter. You remember Jenny from a previous show when we were talking about the Bicep 2 results. We have a talk from the BBC Sky at Night's Chris North and not one, but three astronomy themed quizzes with great prizes. Has there been an Astro Camp yet where we haven't given away at least one telescope? No, I don't, I don't think there has been. Um, and this time we have a quiz for the children, one for the adults, and a super tough one for individuals to see who really knows their stuff. And that's in addition to the beginner's tutorials from Pat Franks on our own Damien and the great skies for three nights. So that's from the 20th to the 23rd of September and it's all included in your admission price of £38 per adult, £20 per teenager and £15 quid for kids. It's in the International Dark Sky Reserve of the Brecon Beacons so the skies are absolutely awesome and we especially welcome absolute beginners. So don't worry, even if you don't have a scope of your own, there'll be plenty here for you to look through. So take a look for Astro Camp on Facebook and at the Astro Camp on Twitter, and you can book now at www.astrocamp.org.uk. We'll see you there. Well, that's all from us until the August Sky Guide comes out later in the month. We're now off to cultivate our next batch of red weed prior to the impending invasion of planet Earth and your only hope of salvation is by giving in to Martian servitude or accepting certain death. Hmm. And on that cheery note, it's goodbye from Cydonia Base. Awesome Astronomy is produced by Ralph Wilkins, Paul Hill, Damian Phillips and John Wildridge and is free to distribute for educational purposes. Music is courtesy of Star Salzman. For more astronomy news, views, help and advice, visit our website at www.awesomeastronomy.com You can join in the astronomy discussion on our Facebook group and you can follow us on Twitter at Awesome Astro Pod. We invite your questions to read out on the show. You can send them to us via Facebook, Twitter, or by email at the show at awesomeastronomy.com. We thank you very much for listening. From Cydonia Base, end of transmission. Mad Martians. Is he trying to be funny? Mad. He... <laughs> Mad, <laughs> mad, us, ho, ho. Jeez. <laughs> 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 <laughs>